Good evening, everybody. From our capital city, Toronto, I'm Steve Pakin. In just nine days, we'll be voting in an Ontario general election. And here are the three major party leaders. Kathleen Wynne is the leader of the Ontario Liberals. Tim Hudak is the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. Good evening. And Andrea Horvath is the leader of the New Democratic Party of Ontario. The questions tonight all come from you, the voters. We asked Ontarians to send us suggested questions over the last few weeks, and we got about a thousand of them. Ooh, wow. Representatives from the Consortium of Broadcasters who are airing this debate chose six questions, and the six they picked reflected those issues you wanted to see debated the most. The leaders have not seen the questions ahead of time. They and you will see them now for the first time. They're on video. Our format will first feature a one-on-one -on -one debate, and then the third leader will eventually join in. Leaders, welcome. Good to be with you this evening. You. Our first question tonight is about ethics in government. Kathleen Wynne, you'll have the first chance to respond. So let's roll the tape, please. Hello, my name is Suresh Naik. I am from Guelph, Ontario. My question is towards Ms. Kathleen Wynne. And the question is, how can I trust a liberal government with my retirement money? when they have squandered a billion dollar on a gas plant scandal and then tried to hide it? How can I trust that there will be money left when I am ready to retire? Ms. Wynne, your reply. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everyone. Bonsoir, Annie, Bojo. It's, uh, it's a real privilege to be here. And Suresh, I want to thank you for that question. You and all Ontarians have a right to expect ethical behavior from your leaders. You do from all politicians, and uh, I want to address. I want to address the uh, issue, particularly of the uh, relocation of the gas plants. D the decisions uh, around the relocation of the gas plants that were made were wrong. I've apologized. I've taken responsibility for those decisions, but they were wrong, Suresh. And there was public money that was wasted in those uh, in those decisions, and that shouldn't have happened. And in the process, the, um, the public good was sacrificed to partisan interest. I got involved in politics because I want to protect the public good. I believe that government must be a force for good. And that's exactly why, when I came into this role, I moved, I acted to make changes that would ensure that that would not happen again. But I know, I know that people uh, are still angry. You have a right to be angry because because there was, uh, there was a, a breach of trust between government and the people of the province. But I, I, ensure, I assure you that uh, I have taken action, and I took action for the exact reason that you have raised tonight, that it is very important that the people of the province, that you and everyone in the province have the ability to trust the ethical behavior of their leaders. Ms. Horvath, you have a chance to reply to that. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. First and foremost, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the debate tonight. This debate is exactly about cleaning up uh, corruption at the legislature uh, down the street. You know, you are hardworking, honest people, and you deserve a hardworking, honest government. The Liberals have betrayed you. They've lied to you, and they've wasted billions and billions of your dollars. My plan is one that respects your tax dollars and invests invest those tax dollars in your priorities. And so, Juresh, Juresh rather, your, your question is the actual question of the evening, and I'm glad that you've, you've brought it forward. Uh, you don't have to put up uh, with a corrupt Liberal Party that wastes your money. You don't have to be worried about the fact uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, your government is not respectful of your dollars. That's what we've put up with for far too long in this province. And, and, and you know, I, I actually uh, I'm quite concerned that, uh, that we're not going to see any difference coming forward. New Democrats have, I think, demonstrated very clearly that we listen to you. We listen to Ontarians. We respect what you have to say and we try to make a difference for you. Uh, when it comes to retirement income, uh, we know that the Liberals are about to um, introduce into Ontario in a couple of months uh, a Harper-style private uh, pension plan, which I think is the wrong direction. Uh, so you talked about retirement income. Uh, I don't see any real moves in, in terms of retirement income, but, but I understand your concern very much in terms of whether or not the Liberal Party can be trusted with okay. your retirement funds. Thank you, Ms. Horvath, for that. Now the rules provide for one-on-one -on -one yeah. between so, the two Suresh, of you. So, let me, let me just come back to uh, what I said off the top. I, I, am, I am so sorry that uh, 
public funds were wasted in the way that they were. And as I said, it's exactly the reason that when I came into this office, I moved to change the rules to ensure that uh, that, that couldn't happen again. We brought in legislation. Uh, I changed the rules across government about retention of documents. So I, ha I made a lot of changes. But, uh, you know, this, this election is... Uh, a very is a very very important one and there's some very stark choices you you mentioned uh, retirement income in fact we have we are proposing uh, a retirement pension plan that's modeled on the CPP so I'm not sure exactly where uh, Ms. Horvath is coming from in terms of the nature of the plan that we're putting forward but we all know well, but that Wynn, Canada pension but plan Wynn, clearly, we all know that the Canada pension plan should be enhanced and Stephen Harper has decided not to do it. in your budget which is part of your it. plan is PRPPs those are Harper's style private pension plans that you intend in bringing to Ontario this year. But you know what? There's but a question that I have for you. And it's a question I think Ontarians want answered. You had a choice when you were going to sign off on those gas plant documents. You had a choice. Why did you not choose to stand up for the people of Ontario and ensure that those documents weren't signed? Why did you not respect the people of Ontario, why did you make the wrong choice? And Andrea, I have taken responsibility for being part of a government that made decisions that were wrong. They were the wrong decisions. I have taken responsibility for that. I've apologized before and I've apologized again tonight. But I really need to clarify, when you talk about uh, the uh, PRPPs, which is one mechanism for saving, what we're proposing in our budget is a re retirement pension plan that would be Are modeled you saying very that you much. Don't have PRPPs? Sorry, what I'm, what we're proposing in our is budget is that we would bring in a retirement pension plan that is modeled on the CPP. It's modeled on the Canada pension plan because Stephen Harper has decided he's not going to enhance the Canada pension plan. So, Shresh, in terms of in terms of the retirement pension plan that we're bringing forward, this is not a this is not a tax. This is not money you'd be giving to the government. This is savings that you would have. And quite frankly, uh, you know, young people people in their 20s and 30s and 40s are not saving enough. And so we believe that they have a right to have uh, a secure retirement. That's why we're bringing the retirement pension plan for. PRPPs, well, Ms. Wynn, what, PRPPs what are another thing. Yes, they're another thing, but you've included them in your pan well, plan, and you're not kicking them down the road till 2017. You're putting them in your plan for this year, for September. So that's obviously your priority. But but the question, it around, is not our the priority. question around the wrong decision <laughs> you true. made in signing off on the gas plans is an important one, because it speaks exactly to ethics and leadership. You had a chance to stand up for Ontarians. You had a chance not to sign that document and you made the wrong decision there so you might call it a mistake uh, but others call it corruption Ms. Wynn and that is the crux of, of, of Shiresh's well, uh, question and it's the, the crux I believe of, of this uh, election right well now. and Andrew I know that that's a word that you've been using a lot but I I need I need you to understand I need uh, the people in the province to understand that uh, I take responsibility that I was part of a government that um, made decisions that were not the right decisions. In terms of the retirement security that we're proposing, yeah, there are a number of ways to save for retirement. PRPPs, the pooled retirement uh, plans, those are optional. We're putting forward a plan that would model the CPP. Okay, thanks, Ms. Wim. We now invite Mr. Hudak to join the debate. Well, well thank you. And, uh, Shresh, thank you very much. Um, perfect question to start out the night. Look, you, you saw an impressive performance uh, by Ms. Wynn. She looked in the camera and said that she apologized, but, you know, quite frankly, Andrea, you and I have seen that act a few times before. And you know very well at home, Shiresh, that if somebody apologizes and then they do the same thing again and again, they didn't mean it. And they're simply going to do it one more time. You, you know that if Kathleen Wynne, the Liberals, get away with that gas plant scandal, they're going to do it again. And look, I'm not going to be the best actor on the stage tonight. I'm not going to be somebody who's going to come up here and do a, a great performance. I'm going to tell you like it is. You'll hear from Ms. Horvath and Ms. Wynn what they think that you want to hear. I'll tell you what we need to do together. We actually need to spend less, not more. We need to focus on job creation, getting people back to work in our province. And we need somebody in the Premier's chair who's a competent economic manager to make government work for you and give you honest government. Sure, so if I had a cabinet minister that pulled off these stunts like we saw with eHealth, with Orange, with a gas plant scandal, I'd kick them out of cabinet. If my cabinet ministers don't make good on their promises to you to reduce spending, to balance the budget, I'll dock their pay. And I have to ask Kathleen directly back. This is a bit like reverse question period. 
<laughs> Andrea asked you a very good question now twice. You stood there when Dalton McGinty put in front of you like the podium you have right now, a document that cost the taxpayers over a billion dollars. Why didn't you just say no? Well, Tim, you know, I, uh, I, I think that you know perfectly well that uh, I was part of a cabinet. There were, but, but you there were decisions the being made, and I've said, I've said that the decisions weren't right. When I came into this office, I opened up the process so that we could get all the information but, but that, that you were asking Steve, for. Respectfully, so, you were, you're not, I, they're not, not one of many at the cabinet table, Ms. Wynne. You are the one who had the document in front of her. You are the co-chair of the Liberal election campaign. Yours is the signature on that contract that sold taxpayers up the river. You had a choice. You had an opportunity. You could have said no and saved us a billion dollars. It was so, in front of you. Why didn't you Tim, just you say know, no? Tim, you know, I, I was, as I said, I was part of a government and I was part of a cabinet that made decisions with, that were not right. And I've, I've appeared before the committee twice and we opened up that process. I appeared before the committee twice and I told the committee exactly what I knew and when I knew it and what I did. And I did not, I did not direct, as you know, I did not direct all of the decisions. And I, I have said that they were wrong. But Tim, you know, it, it is... It is a challenge to say when there's been a mistake. I guess I would ask you, and I think people at home have a, have a, a right to know, if you make a mistake in your platform and the numbers are wrong and it's a completely flawed premise, do you then apologize or not? Kathleen, well, come I, on. I, I mean, how, no, can you, I, how, can you, how can you say the well, same thing as an argument among economists and how many jobs we're going to create when they agree we're going to create jobs? How can you compare that to taking a billion dollars out of the pockets of viewers tonight? Because how can you compare that talking, to your decision to actually sign that document? Because, and because Kathleen, Tim, you know that you were so in front of the why. committee. So you mentioned the committee. The bottom, you said it only cost forty million dollars when you knew full well the same it was a billion. Okay, let's go one at a time, please. Steve, she gets one of the time. We haven't heard from Ms. Horvath in a while. The bottom line is we've seen the same behavior over and over by the Liberal Party over a number of years. It's not just the gas plant scandal. It's e-health. It's orange. It's not being able to get a sense of what's happening with the Pan Am game security budget. Now apparently there's a building downtown where there's an issue. It's the problem with the Liberal Party. It's not one individual. You can change the chairs around the table, but the corruption in the Liberal Party runs deep and it continues to rear its head over and over and over again. And so I think that that's what Ontarians are frankly concerned yeah. about. You're hardworking, honest people and you want to have a hardworking, honest government. And we have seen the Liberal party not be able to deliver that and that's why this election you do have a choice you don't have to choose between a corrupt liberal party that wastes your money and mr hudak frankly who's got some bad math got so, a minute left in this well, segment so 30 yeah. and 30 please yeah. so i just i just need to be clear that uh the allegations the false allegations that uh, that you're making andrea are just that and i have been very open about my role and i have brought in changes to make sure that uh, what happened with the glass, gas plant relocation doesn't happen again. But each of the other situations that you talked about, whether it's, whether it's e-health, where now thousands of, of uh, people in Ontario have electronic health records, or Orange, where we have made changes at the organization, each one of those situations was different and needed a different okay. response, and we gave that response. We need to save some time for Mr. Huda. You know, um, if somebody apologizes, and then they do the same thing over and over again. They didn't mean it. And sadly, while Ms. Wynne says that she changed the laws, we see the scandals keep happening. With Orange and now with this real estate boondog of Mars that took $300 million on health care, you know very well if they get away with this, they're going to try it again and you'll pay the price. Thank you, leaders. That is our first question. We now move on to question two. This one is about energy and electricity. And let's roll the tape, please. Good evening. My name is Zishan Mustafa and I'm from Ajax, Ontario. The question that I have for the leaders tonight is, what will your government do to ensure that energy in Ontario remains affordable, low cost and regulated in the best interest of the consumer? Thank you. All right, Andrea Horvath, you have the first reply to this one. Well, I'm really glad you raised that uh, question because it is exactly what's on the mind of Ontarians everywhere in this province that I travel. You know, I just did a town hall meeting not too long ago on the phone and I was talking to a woman in Sudbury who told me that her electricity bill 
costs her about $15,000 annually, $15,000 for her hydro. And what she's hearing from the Liberals is that that's going to go up uh, by 42%. New Democrats don't believe uh, that uh, we should have the highest electricity rates in our province. We know, in fact, that not only is that uh, problematic for yourself and for people like the woman that I uh, spoke to from Sudbury, but it's also a problem when it comes to our economy and ensuring that we can keep jobs and investment here. So New Democrats are talking about things differently than the Liberals uh, and the Conservatives, both, by the way, uh, who uh, support the privatization and deregulation brought in initially by Conservatives, followed up uh, in spades by, uh, by the Liberals. Uh, we actually believe that our electricity system uh, should be serving the needs of homeowners and uh, businesses uh, and the people that live in this province. So we have a number of different ideas uh, that we would like to implement. First and foremost, there are four different agencies that are currently in the electricity system. We're going to collapse those agencies. We're going to save on a bureaucrat salary. And we're going to cap the salaries, frankly, not only for the CEOs in hydro, but also uh, across our public sector. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we're actually marketing our energy uh, in a way that's beneficial uh, to Ontarians. Right now, the Auditor General says $1.8 billion of subsidization is happening uh, when we're selling our electricity across the borders and lighting up the Manhattan skyline. Uh, that's not good enough for Ontario. Uh, we are going to make sure uh, that our electricity system is, uh, is meeting our needs, uh, and we're going to do it to, because we have been listening to you about your concerns in electricity. There are a number of other issues that we are going to uh, deal with on, in the electricity sector, and I'll be talking about them in further debate. Thank you. And we continue the discussion with Tim Hudak. You know, one of the reasons, Ishan, that your hydro bill has gone up is because of the gas plant scandal. And four times both Ms. Horvath and I asked Ms. Wynne to say why she didn't simply say no to Dalton McGuinty when he put the document in front of her that cost us a billion dollars in the gas plant scandal. I don't think you heard an answer. And Ms. Wynne says it's a mistake. It's like it's some kind of parking ticket. It's not a mistake. It was a deliberate decision to take money out of your pockets to save two Liberal seats. We've got to change that. I'll tell you a quick story, Zeeshan, about why this is important for jobs, too, because my plan is focused on creating more jobs and getting people back to work. I was at a plant recently in Niagara. They make packaging material for food products, safe packaging. They've got a good niche. They're selling more across North America. That's a good thing. But they said, Tim, our power rates in Texas are 60% lower than our plant in Ontario. We're an Ontario company. We, we, we love this place. We want to expand here. Ten new machines. Four men and women each machine, 40 jobs. But with that big hydro price difference, where are you going to put the machines? And with them go the jobs. I have a plan to take $20 billion of hydro costs out by turning off the tap on these expensive subsidies for wind and solar and not signing any more contracts. And I'm confident that will create 40,000 more jobs in our province, particularly in industry, the backbone of our middle class. Thank you, Mr. Hudak. Ms. Horvath. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, Mr. Hudak has a plan to privatize what's left of our electricity system when, in fact, it was the privatization that came into Ontario uh, when he sat around the cabinet table uh, that has caused the problem that we have now with our electricity rates. I think everybody, everybody I think, believes that Mr. Hudak will actually privatize more of the hydro system. I don't think people believe, though, that they're going to get the rates down. And, and that's the crux of the matter. One of the things that we are committed to is immediately getting the HST off of your electricity bill to make sure your bill uh, is uh, at least a little bit more manageable. Manageable. Of course, the other things that we're going to do are going to take a little bit more time to implement. However, uh, what, we, uh, what we will see is be us being able to hold the line on the rates. We're also going to have the Auditor General review all of those private power deals that Ms. Wynne and Mr. Hudak has been, have been signing over the years uh, to see if there's any opportunity at all uh, to get some, uh, some better deals, some, some more value for Ontarians. Uh, there is a mess in our electricity system. You're the ones that are paying the price for it, frankly, uh, and it's because the other two parties uh, have, uh, have taken us to where we are now. I'll tell you something else, um, Zeeshan and those watching at home. Our hydro policy of more affordable energy is good for jobs. It's one of the primary components of doing business in the province, particularly for manufacturing. And it's one of the biggest bills we all pay in our own home after our mortgage. By taking $20 billion in costs out of the system, that'll be an average savings of $384 for a typical family across Ontario. It's not going to solve all the problems in the world, Steve, but at least it's a good start. Let me tell you a bit more about my plan. 
I'll also restore local decision making when it comes to these massive industrial wind farms that the Liberals and the NDP support of this legislation are forcing into your communities. And it seems to be pretty simple too. If, if Quebec or Newfoundland, if they offered us cheap green hydroelectricity at a cost half of which we're paying for the industrial wind farms, I'd take that deal. It's affordable energy for you, for businesses, and it'll stop turning our beautiful landscapes in the province into these pin cushions. Well, one of the like things I, I would agree with. Farms. One of the things that I would agree with is the uh, is the way that the Liberals implemented the Green Energy Act. Frankly, uh, uh, Mr. Hudak, I certainly b uh, agreed with the the premise, with the idea of bringing new renewables onto the grid. But when the Liberals decided to go whole hog with huge international companies, instead of looking at community benefit, instead of uh, looking at municipalities and and farm co-ops and First Nations for the opportunities to bring renewables onto our grid. Uh, the, the shame of it is that the Liberals have taken something that, that I think everybody believes is, is good. You know, renewable energy people believe in that. But they've taken that and they've ended up putting it in, in place in Ontario in a way that pits you know, family against sure, family, sure. you know, neighbor against neighbor, municipality and, against it, municipality. It's an excellent point, it has but been I'm just a failed ask, implementation. Respectfully, Andrew, I'll ask you this back. The, the PC caucus brought forward three different bills that would restore local decision making like you say that you support and that would end these expensive subsidies but Andrew while you say that tonight each and every time you voted with the Liberals you had three times to say no to these projects and three times you betrayed constituents across Ontario for the Liberals so was that a mistake then, or are you just changing your story tonight? Uh, no, Mr. Hudak. In fact, we all know what your emotions look like when you bring them to the legislature. They usually have something in there uh, that makes no sense whatsoever. And so please describe so that to this me, because I remember being, one in particular that said they'd restore local with the people decision. of Ontario. And that's our time for the one-on-one. -on -one. Ms. Wynn now gets thank into the you, action. Thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate the question. You know, when we came into office in 2003, the electricity system was in disarray. We were having brownouts and blackouts, and no one so far tonight has talked about the critical need for reliability in the system. The investments that we have made in the system uh, to, to build, for example, more than 10,000 kilometers of transmission line were desperately needed because they had been, the system had been neglected. So, Zishra, to make sure that the lights would come on when you turn the switch on, that's the work we've been doing, and that's the work we need to continue to do. But we recognize we absolutely recognize that there are people who are struggling to pay their bills. There are businesses that are struggling to pay their bills. So that's why we have programs in place to help people with, uh, with paying their bills. The Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, which Tim Hudak has said he will take off all bills, that would increase everyone's bill by 10% right off the bat. We've got that on there because we know people are struggling. But Ms. Wynn, you're the, telling the people they're going to the be paying 42% more. To, the Northern, the northern more. Industrial Energy people Rate can't afford is their in place right now. to time, help please, businesses. Please the Northern Industrial Energy Rate is in place to help businesses so that they can compete. But the reliability that we need, you know, Pickle Lake needs more capacity. Neither of the people standing here tonight, except for our plan, has said how they would make sure that all of the communities in Ontario have the reliability that they need. Our plan makes those investments because we know that electricity is needed all over the province. Steve, if I could um, talk more about my plan as well. Look, my, my plan is called the Million Jobs Plan. It's a plan for lower taxes to create jobs. It's a plan to have less government debt and balancing the books. And it's a plan for affordable energy. You know, one of the reasons your bill has gone up so much is because under Dalton McGuinty and then now Kathleen Wynne, the hydro bureaucracy has mushroomed in size. And believe it or not, there are 11,000 people at Ontario Hydro, Hydro One and OPG, making $100,000 a year more. No wonder your bill's gone up. And the Ontario Power Authority, which Dalton McGinty created and Andrew Horvath and Kathleen Wynne support, that mushroomed from 12 employees to 250, so this, 84 of whom are making $100,000 a year more. And their whole job is to drive up your hydro bill sending contracts. Well, well so, I, I'm clear. I would so, downsize that bureaucracy and pass on the savings to people just, at home. Can I just get in just for a sec? Because uh, this election, you know, is, is coming down to a very stark choice. And uh, Mr. Hudak talk, talks about his million jobs plan, which is not that, which is based on a completely flawed premise. Our plan 
is to invest in the communities, in the people and their talent and skills, to invest in the infrastructure, including electricity infrastructure. You know, I would you know, agree. In our plan, I would agree in that our plan, let's, let's having a choice. I believe that this is Hang a vote. Can we let her finish her answer yes. and then we'll come I just, over here? You know, uh, when I talk about investment, I'm talking about uh, con connectivity like making sure that farm communities and rural communities can have access to natural gas. That's part of our plan. That's the kind of investment that needs to be made if we're going to compete. Ms. Horvath. Uh, I was about to say that I actually don't disagree with, uh, with Ms. Wynne's uh, suggestion that, uh, that this election is about a choice. But I would put to the people of Ontario, to put to you, that you don't have to choose between bad ethics and bad math. You can choose a plan that makes sense. And what makes sense is getting rid of the duplication, getting rid of the overlap in our electricity system, uh, giving you a break by getting the HST off of your hydro bills, not going on this road of privatization uh, that the other two parties but prefer, I think... but doing something that makes sense for you and for your family because it'll help stabilize those rates, ensure the investments are there, but keeping you at the front of the agenda, which, which really has not been happening but, in Stephen, terms of our electricity system. Mr. Mm -hmm. Hudak Thank and then you. Ms. Okay. Wynn. Steve, thanks. And you know, it just seems to be very straightforward, I guess I'm the only one saying this, that we need to downsize that expensive hydro bureaucracy and then pass on the savings to you at home In fact, and I to our employers exactly the so they can Mr. hire Hudak. more people. And people ask me, well, how are you going to actually um, reduce the size and cost of government? Our plan is to get it to about 2009 levels, reduce it from 1.2 million workers to 1.1 million workers. My colleagues know a lot of that's going to be by attrition and retirement. But there's a lot of government jobs we don't need. And the Ontario Power Authority, an expensive new hydro bureaucracy, they spend their entire day trying to figure out how to make your bill higher. They're the ones that sign these contracts for the very expensive wind and solar projects, and then we have to sell it to New York and Quebec. To get, it makes no okay. sense. So, I would close down that bureaucracy. I'd pass okay. on the savings. So to last you, word in this so segment here. Mr. Hudak has sanitized the fact that he has committed to cutting 100,000 jobs. 100,000 people who provide frontline service in this province. The fact is, we need those workers. We need the hydro workers. We need the firefighters and the police officers. We need the personal support workers. And so the choice that you're but, confronting but is investment, investment in communities and making sure that we have reliable That's electricity. That's our time in this segment, but I have a feeling we will continue this discussion <laughs> any second now because our third video question comes to us from Peterborough, Ontario. It is about jobs in the economy. Uh, Tim Hudak, you'll get the first chance to respond. Kathleen Wynne, you will respond after that. Then we'll see a one-on-one -on -one between the two of you. Let's roll the tape. My name is Debbie Lovegrove from Peterborough, Ontario. My question is for Tim Hudak. On the one hand, you say you're going to eliminate 100,000 public service jobs, and then in the next breath, you're saying you're going to have a million new jobs. It doesn't compute for me. How are you going to do that? Well, thanks, Debbie, for the question. You know, when I talk to um, employers across the province and I say, what's the most important thing that we can do to give you confidence to add more men and women to the payrolls in Ontario? Now, hydro does come up, lower taxes for sure, less red tape, especially for small business. That's all part of my million jobs plan. But, you know, Debbie, the number one thing they say, it's the provincial debt. It's the big deficits that have been run up under the Liberals. I mean, nobody's investing in Greece these days. Nobody's investing in Detroit. So that's the biggest load we have on our backs is holding back job creation. We need to balance the books. Just like at home, if you're running up the credit card bill, you actually have to spend less. I'm being very direct and honest about that. Now, look, I, I know that you'll hear from my other two colleagues. They'll say they can balance the books and everybody keeps their job and they keep spending. But you know in your heart that's not true. So just like at home, how do you do this? Well, you do so in a thoughtful, practical, and compassionate way. It does mean we'll have to get government back to where it was in about 2009. And quite frankly, in 2009, I didn't hear a charge that we had too little government. In fact, I heard the opposite. So we'll go from 1.2 million to 1.1 million positions on the payroll. The vast majority of those positions will be through retirement, people who leave the civil service. In fact, that's between 5 and 9% a year, so over a four-year phase-in period, you're looking at probably 250 to 350,000 workers. You don't have to replace all of them. That's the big share. Secondly, though, Debbie, I think we also have to contract out. If somebody can deliver a service at a better cost to taxpayers and improve that service, I think we should give them a shot. Go bus, for example. Go train is run by Bombardier. Why not go bus?
But there are positions that we no longer need, like the Ontario Power Authority that drives up your hydro bill, like Drive Clean. I'll close down the middle management that is taking money out of the system to protect the front lines and so we can grow the economy. Thank you, Mr. Hudak. Ms. Winner, reply. Thank you very much. Debbie, thank you very much for your question. And this election, it, you have touched on the issue. It is about jobs. It's about uh, making sure that people have access to good, well-paying jobs. And our plan is about making the investments that, that we know we need. So our greatest resource is our people and the talent and the skills of people. When I talk to, uh, to business owners, they talk to me like uh, Dr. Oatgore or like GE. They, they look to the skills and the talent of our workforce to, uh, to expand, their, uh, expand their businesses and bring more jobs to this province. So investing in the talent and skills of our people and making sure that people have access to education, access to training programs. Investing in infrastructure that is needed in all of our communities and is absolutely critical in terms of people being able, businesses being able to move their goods. And then partnering with business. We have a very competitive competitive tax rate. We are very competitive in terms of our, uh, our workforce, but making sure that we have that partnership government to business, which I know uh, Tim Hudak does not support, but we have, we have demonstrated over and over that that kind of partnership brings jobs to Ontario and allows businesses to expand and move from, a, for example, a, a traditional manufacturing to advanced manufacturing. That kind of partnership that allows businesses to invest in technology and be able to move to the next level. That's the plan that we're bringing forward to the people of Ontario. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wynne. One-on-one -on -one debate. Sure. Th thanks, Steve. Uh, and Debbie, again, it's an excellent question. And, you know, there's only one leader on the stage tonight who's going to be honest with you to say that if we want to balance the books, it means we'll have to spend less money. You can't balance a credit card by spending more. But if we do that, if we balance the budget, that means we can keep taxes low. It means we can make steady investments in our infrastructure like our hospitals and our highways. And it sends a, a signal across the world that Ontario is open for business. I mean, my whole plan is all about jobs. And I'm talking about good jobs, yeah. middle class jobs, career jobs you can count on, not the part-time but... jobs that all we see out there today. Ms. Wynne brings up the corporate welfare. Look, I think that a corporate welfare, she has a $2 billion slush fund. There's no application criteria. Uh, there's no Tim, accountability. All you I... need to do is hire Tim... the right lobbyists. And I think it's much <laughs> smarter to use that money to lower taxes for all job careers. So I'm not going to give Steve a grant. I'm not well, going to give Andrew Grant either, but a lower so, tax is so for both of you so you can both clear. hire. Let's just be clear. Because what Mr. Hudak is talking about, in fact, is that he would have walked away from the auto sector in this province. He would not have worked with the auto sector and supported the auto sector at the time when it was going through a crisis, he would have walked away from the auto sector. He would not have partnered with Dr. Oetker in London, for example, so that jobs could be created there. He would have walked away from partnerships that would allow us, as, a, as an economy, to expand. And there is only one leader standing here right now who would push us back to recession with his plan, and that is Mr. Hudak. And I believe that making the investments right now to allow us to to grow the economy, to allow us to work with business, that that is the way forward. Not, not cutting 100,000 jobs and really pushing us back. We are in uncertain times. We are recovering. The recovery is taking hold. You can feel it. But the shock to the system that what Tim Hudak is suggesting would actually push us backwards and would be irresponsible. You know well, I'm really glad that oh, Debbie... You, oh, you're sorry, you're not in oh, yet. This okay, is still one-on-one. Sorry. One -on -one. sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Hudak. My plan is going to create jobs. A lot of them. And look, I'm excited about my plan because I know what's going to work. I know in my heart and in my mind that lower taxes mean that businesses are going to invest in Ontario again, hire more men and women in our province. I know in my heart and in my mind that lower energy costs, affordable energy, will mean that industry hires again. And I know that if we balance the budget in our province, don't go deeper in debt, it's going to attract more investment. You know what? But I'm so why? confident, Debbie, in my plan. I'm so confident in my plan that it's going to work that if I don't actually carry through in my plan, if I don't keep my promises in the million jobs plan, I'll resign. I'll step down from office. That's how confident I am in my pledge to you watching at home that my plan's going to work. 
is going to say that hope is back in Ontario, well, that opportunity is around the corner. If I don't I do hear, it, 30 seconds, I'll I step hear aside. The passion. I hear the passion in Mr. Hudak's voice, but Mr. Hudak, I think, owes you uh, an explanation as to the plan that he's putting forward and how, how it is based on a flawed premise that no economists have agreed to that that plan is actually going to work. What we're proposing is that we have seen recovery. We are seeing recovery, and we now need to build on that recovery. And the investments in people and in uh, supports with business and partnerships with business and investments in infrastructure will move us forward. And now we welcome Ms. Horvath. Thank you. I, the, I was looking at the clock. It was at zero, so I apologize <laughs> to both of my colleagues for that. Is that clock uh, not working? It, it's not working. It's, it, it's, it's kind it? of jumping all over the place. Okay. Our apologies. <laughs> We've got to get that fixed. Uh, so Horvath. I do want to start, though, by thanking Debbie for that important question. I, I've been around this province uh, hearing concerns like yours about jobs and nowhere more than Peterborough, frankly. The last time I was in Peterborough, uh, which was not too long ago, Debbie, your unemployment rate was at 14%. So I can see how you would be worried about jobs. I've seen what it's done to your community, that high unemployment rate. Uh, and I know that you're concerned that a, a plan that uh, somehow is going to uh, bring a million jobs is also going to kick 100,000 families to to the curb. Uh, that's not what we need in Ontario. That's not a plan that makes sense. Uh, both of these parties have, uh, have plans that are pretty much a rerun of what we've already done. Mr. Hudak wants to drive down the corporate tax rate. Ms. Wynne wants to continue just giving handouts, blank checks to companies. New Democrats want to reward job creators. We want to reward people investing in Ontario with tax credits so that we're rewarding uh, the kind of thing that we need, which is productivity investment, job creation. We're going to take small business taxes down because we know small businesses create a lot of jobs in this province. Uh, but what we don't need uh, is, uh, is uh, the same old, same old well, that has lost us 300,000 But what businesses are saying, we're yeah. still 100,000 short but jobs what from before the recession. But what businesses are saying to me is that they need to know that there's some stability in the system. They need to know that they're going to have a steady stream of skilled workers for their, uh, for their plants and for their businesses. They need to know that we're going to invest in infrastructure like high-speed rail between Kitchener-Waterloo and Toronto and then on to London and to Windsor. They need to know that those kinds of investments are coming from government because they, they can't do that on their own. That's what government exists to do. So that's the plan that we're bringing forward, that we will, we will play that role. We will play that role of investing in the environment that will allow businesses to flourish. We've, we've retained... We've created with the private sector more than 460,000 net new jobs since the economic downturn. So that is a very good record. We are on path to recovery, and we need to make sure that we make the investments that will allow us to move forward. Mr. Hudak. <laughs> Respectfully, Kathleen, your record is one of 300,000 lost manufacturing jobs. But, Tim, you're not well, counting Alberta's, the jobs that have been created. You've lost 300,000 manufacturing <laughs> jobs, many in across the province, including in Peterborough. You know, it's sad that Alberta's greatest export is oil, and ours has become our next generation. We've lost 120,000 people who have left Ontario to go to the western provinces. Look, Debbie, I've got a plan to actually bring families together, to bring them home to Ontario, because it'll be good jobs again. You know, last time I was in Peterborough with Scott Stewart, I met a woman named Janet. She worked in the factory there. She had a good job. I noticed when I walked around there weren't that many young people there, and I asked her about that. And she said, you know, Tim, I've got um, two sons. I'm darn proud of them. They did all the right things. They both went to university. One went back to college to hone his skills. But neither one has a job. They're both at home with my husband and I. And I really worry because each day they talk about how their friends have gone out to Alberta, Saskatchewan. I'm afraid those families are going to fly apart. Look, my plan is to make sure Ontario has the lowest tax on job creators anywhere in North America to have affordable energy rates again. My plan will put a million people back to work over the next eight years. But Tim, so my point of view is, let's just get going. Tim, there's no, there's no evidence. You're talking about putting a million people back to work. There's no evidence that your plan would create a million jobs. And I think, I think that Debbie and everyone on, in Ontario has the right to ask how, if you take 100,000 100, jobs out of the economy and you push us back towards recession, how does that create jobs? What I know is that businesses are looking for a partner in government. You know, putting in place a $2.5 billion uh, jobs and prosperity fund over the next 10 years, that will allow us to partner with business, not so that 
government creates the jobs, but government works with business to help them to buy the technology, to make sure that they are able to compete globally. You wouldn't do any of that. Well, and that an would drive us back. No doubt. Is your clock showing it's, 40 seconds yes, left? Yes, it is. It is. There's no doubt seconds. that, uh, thanks, Steve, <laughs> there's no doubt that uh, Mr. Hudak's a million, jo million jobs plan has a million math mistakes in it. There's also no doubt that the Liberals have not delivered on jobs. Uh, I would agree with Mr. Hudak. We're 100,000 jobs fewer than prior to the recession. But how do we get there? that's not true. We don't get <laughs> there by doing the same things that have not not worked for us we are not going to get there by blank checks to companies that then pull up stakes and move somewhere else but we're not going to get there by driving down a corporate tax rate because we've seen that as the liberals have done that that has not but worked let's either deal so with let's facts. reward the job we, creators let's and the investors deal with facts we are 460,000 net new jobs me? up since the, the height of the forgive recession me, we can that's continue the this? fact the fact is this segment's out of time it we got to go on to the fourth question now which will be about debt and deficit in our clock issue is fixed now, so I, I don't need to give you times, I think. Is that right? Debt and deficit. Uh, Kathleen Wynne gets the first reply. Tim Hudak responds to that, and let's roll the tape. Hi, my name is Anthony Hill, and I'm from Waterloo. My question is for Kathleen Wynne. In order to eliminate the deficit by 2017, with population growth and inflation, we'll need to make approximately $10 billion in spending cuts. My question is, what programs do you expect to cut in order to meet the deficit reduction figures detailed in your party platform? Thanks, Anthony, and uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for raising the issue. And uh, I just, I just want to begin by saying that, uh, you know, some of the best conversations that I have about taxes and uh, finances are in grade five classes where kids are learning, uh, are learning about government because we get back to the basics about what, what taxes are, what is, it that, uh, what is it that we pay taxes in order to do. And taxes are the price of looking after each other. They're the, they're the price we pay to make sure that we have the services and we provide the services that we can't provide ourselves. So we understand how important it is that we tackle the deficit. Uh, we have a plan in place to stay on target to balance the uh, budget and eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. And here's how we're going to do it. We are going to keep the constraint measures that we have had in place. We are the leanest program spending per capita government in the country. That means for the 13.5 million people in Ontario, we spend less on programs per person than any other government in the country. So we're going to keep those constraints in place. We are going to ask the top 2% income earners in the province to pay a bit more. But we're not going to raise income tax on the broad swath of middle classes. We're not going to raise HST. We're not going to raise gas tax. We are going to stay on a three-year path to balance, not a two-year path to balance as Mr. Hudak is proposing and we are going to make investments now the investment investments that I've been talking about in our plan in order to make sure that our economy grows in order to make sure that those projections that we have made going forward that they are realized if we make those investments now in infrastructure and in communities and in our people we will be able to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. What we can't do, what we can't do is go backwards. And what Tim Hudak is proposing would take us backwards. The recovery is taking hold. We know we're on track for 2017-18 and we Wayne. have the plan to get there. Mr. Hudak, your reply. Well, Anthony, I think you saw the oldest trick in the book there. Uh, instead of talking about her record, uh, Ms. Wynn said the whole time trying to distort my plan. And she knows what she said is inaccurate. And I listened very closely, that I'm sure you did too, Anthony, and folks watching at home. I didn't hear a single answer to your question. I didn't hear one idea about how she's going to reduce spending. Look, I put mine on the table, and I encourage you to look at it. You can see it at millionjobsplan.com. The choices aren't easy, but they're long overdue. And just like when you pay off a debt, the benefits are worth it for all of us in terms of more jobs and protecting frontline services when we get through it. I've called for an across-the-board wage freeze for all of us, starting with, with me, with the politicians. I know the Ontario Provincial Police Association has objected to that. They've asked for an exemption. But I don't think it's fair to go to somebody working at Costco or making ends meet with two part-time jobs and increase their taxes to pay for more raises for government workers. So there'll be no wage increases for at least two years till we balance the books. Leadership will start at the top. I'll reduce my cabinet down to 16 members from the 27 today. We'll implement good ideas in the Drummond Commission to spend within our means. But I'll ask your question back to 
Ms. Wynn. I mean, Ms. Wynn, it depends on the audience. Sometimes you say you're a big fan of Dalton McGuinty's, and another audience you say that you didn't like what Dalton McGuinty did. So maybe I'll ask you this tonight because the question is asked of you, what Dalton McGuinty programs will you eliminate? I mean, what, what do you regret the most about your shared legacy with Dalton McGuinty? So, Anthony, uh, you, you may know, uh, I, don't, I know that uh, Tim Hudak knows, you may know that we have actually implemented 80% of the report that he's referring to, Don Drummond. And, and people said, you know, you can't keep health care uh, spending increases at under 3%. Well, we've done that. We've done that year after year. We've kept health care uh, increased, uh, increases at uh, under 3%, 2.5%. We also, and uh, I know you, uh, you may know this, but we have included in our plan no increases for, uh, for um, wages and salaries um, over the next four years. We've, we've made it clear that there isn't money to pay higher salaries and, uh, and wage increases. And so that's the kind of constraint but, but measure. You are. That, and that, is, you that not, actually but, but is answer, in answer to your question, Anthony. I, I don't think those are some of the constraint measures that we will keep in place. And that's what makes us one of the, we are the leanest government in the country. You know, how, how can we have the leanest government in the country when we've got the biggest deficit, in fact, greater because than all the, the other provinces combined? the spending per capita is the leanest fair, in the country, Fair enough. Tim. Look, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, Anthony, why it's so important to me to balance the budget. And I suspect you share this view. You know, my grandfather's family lost a family farm during the Depression. They got into debt trouble, and they lost a farm in Petroli, Ontario. And my grandfather used to tell me how heart-wrenching that was for the family to lose a farm in the house. But how embarrassing it was to see all of the family furniture out there on the lawn, on display, and for sale through the bank. So he always told us to spend within our means. Don't, don't get into debt because you get into trouble. Grandma Dylan used to take a part-time job at Walker Brothers on Mitten Street to raise enough money for Christmas for the kids. But he didn't run up a credit card. He didn't run up a debt yeah. because you could lose your house. And provincially, that means we lose what we care about if we go farther into debt. And I'll ask your question one more time to Kathleen because I didn't get an answer. Sometimes you say you like Dalton McGinty, sometimes you say you didn't. So you got a big audience tonight. Please tell us what it is you regret the most about the Dalton McGinty legacy that you share. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you Anthony, what I, am, what I am proud of is that we have created an environment. We have uh, we've put in place $12 billion in tax cuts for families over uh, our time in government, $5 billion in tax cuts for businesses. We have done, we have done a lot to help people, to allow them to, uh, to thrive. My fear is, and I, I think that it's something that, uh, that we all need to consider, what Tim Hudak is suggesting would actually push us back towards recession. So that recovery that I'm talking about that is allowing businesses to thrive, that recovery would be stalled by what Tim Hudak is proposing. And 100,000 families would suffer from losing a job and losing that breadwinner or that income that comes from a good job. Just because and, you say and it over and over again. And that does not make sense to me. Just because you say it over and over again doesn't, doesn't mean it's true. You've said and, and you're going to cut 100,000 jobs. And I've known you for a long time. You've said you're going to cut 100,000 jobs. And we spent a lot jobs. of time together in your office. And I thought of you as an honorable person. I know you work hard, you have some very senior cabinet roles. But, but Kathleen, you're distorting our plan. And when I hear you say that so over and over again... So you're not going to cut 100,000 jobs? That tells me that you're more interested in changing the topic because you didn't give a single answer on how you're going to balance the budget. You refused to answer Andrew Horvath's question or mine and why you didn't say no to Dalton McGinty when he said we're going to charge a billion dollars to cancel a gas plant to save two seats. Look, we're going to reduce the size and cost of government from 1.2 million okay, Mr. to 1.1 million. You're going to push million. us back to a Over recession. a four-year phase of history. Horvath's turn to get in. I also wanted to, uh, to uh, talk about this issue, Anthony, because it's an important one. And certainly, New Democrats are committed to balancing the budget by 2017-18. But I can tell you, we're not going to be doing it uh, on the backs of, uh, of hardworking families in this province. Uh, what we won't be doing is wasting billions and billions of your hard-earned dollars on, uh, on our own political well-being. You know, imagine what that money could have gone to. Imagine what over $3 billion could have done. Le never mind deficit reduction, making sure that our health care system is meeting our needs, making sure that kids don't go to school with empty stomachs. There's a lot uh, that could have been done with those billions of dollars that have been wasted. But I can tell you uh, that New Democrats actually have an idea that makes sense, and that is ensuring that everyone uh, is part of getting us back into balance, getting that deficit well, eliminated. And that's why we're going to uh, raise 
very modestly by 1%. Uh, the corporate tax rate in this province will still be very competitive with everyone else uh, that's around us, competing jurisdictions. But what it will help us do is achieve our goals, achieve our goals in transit and transportation infrastructure, achieve our goals in making sure that we're providing the kind of health care uh, that people expect, achieve our goals in making life more affordable for you and your family. Uh, that's what the priority for New Democrats is. It's actually respecting your tax dollar and and investing your tax dollar in your priorities. And, and so the plan that we have put forward, which is was laid out first in our budget and is uh, and is now laid out in our, our plan for moving forward, is it's a thorough plan. It has been well thought through. It makes the investments that we know are needed. It addresses the issues around revenue that would allow us to get to uh, balance and to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. But it takes into account that we need to work with business. So Business has said to us, you know, our tax rate is competitive. We don't need a higher tax rate, uh, a higher corporate tax rate right now, which is what Andrea Horvath is proposing. We don't need a shock to the system like 100,000 like jobs being taken out of the economy. But we Ms. need your, government your to partner with business didn't do and anything. we need the investments. We have dead money. We have people who are sitting with, with very flesh balance sheets because your ca corporate tax reductions have not led to the results that you were supposed to get. You were supposed to get jobs with tax cuts. Well, they didn't have. come. You well, were supposed we to get investment. It didn't come. We are still very, very poor in terms of our productivity investment. And so doing the same thing over and over again makes no sense. But I've talked to businesses too, and they've told me that a 1% increase is not going to be all that big of a deal, uh, and that they understand that they have to participate in making our economy work, that mm. they have to be part of the solution of unlocking the gridlock. Well, let's part get Mr. Hudak. I don't know how we went Northern from a conversation. Roads. Let's get Mr. Hudak. I don't know how we went from a conversation of how we're going to save money and reduce spending to one of competing tax increases. Look, if you think the taxes are too low, then, then vote for Kathleen Wynne or Andrew Horvath. They just told you how they're going to increase taxes. I think that's going to cost us jobs. If you actually want to balance the budget, you have to reduce spending. And you can only reduce spending by reducing spending. And we need to make those choices now, today, before the debt spirals out of control. And I am confident that a province of Ontario that has a balanced budget that is run well is going to attract and keep well-run businesses. And I've laid out where we can find the savings through the well, Drummond Mr. Commission Mr. report. Hudak, your tough medicine is certainly not Buckley's. It tastes awful, but <laughs> well, it's not going to work. work. But we'll tell you this. I mean, I'm talking about an 8% spending reduction over the work. next four years. 2% a year over four years. 8% reduction. Surely you don't think the government's 92% efficient. And if you do think the government's 92% efficient, you're never going to get us out of this mess. So I just want to go back to Anthony. Uh, I did a, a jobs roundtable in, uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo some months ago. And the issue that came up over and over again was the desire for the young people, the, uh, the innovators, the people who are uh, in that high-tech industry, for them to be connected to the urban centre, to, uh, to the GTHA. And they talked about the need for better connectivity, better train service between Kitchener-Waterloo and Toronto. That was the issue they talked about. So there are jobs being created at OpenText, for example, in Kitchener-Waterloo. Sure. Another, another uh, partnership that Tim Hudak doesn't, doesn't support. But those kinds of partnerships and the investments in infrastructure are exactly what we need to bring Wynne, jobs so and retain in, them in so Ontario. If we're so deep in debt, where are you getting all this money? He asked you how you're going to cut spending. You talked about spending more. You talked about a high-speed rail train, about 4 or $5 billion. You're acting like somebody who won the lottery well, when you know that you're bankrupt. I'm, you just don't have no, the money. I'm talking and I wish about, you were honest with Ontarians that you've actually spent okay, all the money five seconds and we're in debt. I'm talking about investing now so that we have that bright future. We know that that is what is needed right now. We do not need a shock to the system that is going to push us back into okay. recession. And moving on to our fifth question right now. This one will be about transit and infrastructure. It will first feature uh, Ms. Horvath and Ms. Wynne, and let's now roll the tape. Hello, my name is Pauline Polly, and I live in Coburg, Ontario, and this is my question. Do you think that Ontario drivers should have to contribute to the Toronto transit system when Torontonians who use the transit system are far better off than someone who has to drive their vehicle to work and has car payments, insurance, gas bills, and wear and tear on their vehicles. Thank you. Ms. Horvath, you're up uh, first. Colleen, I think uh, you've uh, 
really touched on a very important topic in, in all ways, and, and that is the problem uh, with uh, affordability of, of driving, uh, as well as the challenge we have in terms of infrastructure, uh, both transit infrastructure in the GTHA, as well as infrastructure around this province in, in roads and highways. Uh, and I can start by assuring you that uh, I've listened to what drivers have said about how unaffordable it is to drive in this province. Many communities don't have public transit. They don't have sub Ways. They're not able uh, to make any other choice other than their car. And I think that's exactly what you're, uh, you're referring to. So we are committed to actually getting 15% reduction in your auto insurance rates. It's a promise that the Liberals made in the last budget, uh, but they've not made good on it. In fact, it's one of the reasons why we're in this election campaign, because notwithstanding you know, the corruption and waste that we've seen, we also saw a government that made all kinds of promises in this last budget, but didn't keep their promises from the last budget. So we will be able to get 15% reduction in your auto insurance rates, but we will also be investing in roads and highways around this province, 60 kilometers of investment uh, each and every year, uh, some specifically for Northern Ontario, some for the rest of, uh, of the province. But we're also committed to making sure uh, that, uh, that the Southwest, if you will, or the Niagara, Hamilton corridor, the Kitchener-Waterloo, uh, Toronto corridor, as well as the transit system right to in the uh, the GTA, the, the downtown Toronto system is uh, uh, is invested in. Why? Uh, because we know uh, that uh, that's something that uh, that is necessary for our economy. But we've actually identified how we're going to pay for that, uh, which is not something that the, the Liberals have done. Uh, we know that it takes everybody to make that happen. What we're not going to do, though, is bring new dirty diesel trains into the downtown of the city, which is what Ms. Wynne and the Liberals have done. We're going to make sure we focus on a downtown relief line. We're going to get infrastructure to the Ring of Fire in Northern thank Ontario. You, These That's are the time. priorities. That's time. Ms. Uh, Wynne for thank a reply. You. Um, thank you very much and thank you, Colleen. And I think your question was about the uh, the relationship between infrastructure in, uh, in the Toronto area and outside of. You know, if you commute for three or four hours um, in the car, it's hard to get to your kid's soccer game. But if you live in a, a community and the bridges are shut down, that creates, uh, that creates a problem too. So the plan that we're bringing forward for transportation and infrastructure uh, acknowledges both of those issues. And so the $29 billion that we are proposing to invest in transportation infrastructure is divided between the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, so $15 billion for the, uh, the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, and $14 billion outside of the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. And that means roads and bridges, and it means transit because all of that is necessary in order for us to be able to have an integrated transportation system and you know people outside of the greater Toronto Hamilton area drive in and we uh, we have a lot of people moving in and out of uh, different parts of the province but we recognize we recognize that there has to be there have to be different solutions for different parts of the province so that that investment of $29 billion divided between the GTHA and beyond, which is, which is fully costed in our budget, and quite frankly, it's laid out exactly how we will pay for it. We will repurpose some of the gas tax money and some of uh, HSD that's already, uh, that's already being paid and direct that absolutely towards transportation infrastructure. One on one debate. You know, one of the things that uh, Ms. Wynne likes to do is talk about uh, her commitment to transportation and transit. But when she was the Minister of Transportation, she cut $4 billion to the transit plan uh, for the GTHA. Uh, when she was Minister of Transportation, she actually cut a bus replacement program. The bus replacement program helps communities like yours uh, to be able to replace uh, the, the buses uh, so that they can have better service in the local community. Communities. But one of the things New Democrats said from day one is that we would not support a budget if it had new taxes, tolls and fees on middle class families. Why? Because we know that life is already too difficult for people. They so can't make... Uh, uh, bills meet at the end of the month. Uh, people are very frustrated. In fact, they fall off their chair when they open their bill like their electricity bill. Hydro, for sure, uh, but, uh, but your auto insurance bills as well are problematic. So, so our, our plan is actually thing. one that invests in well, uh, not only communities, uh, but in, uh, in larger communities, but in northern Ontario okay. as well. But Andrea, and the, in the here's downtown. the thing. Here's the thing. Your plan actually rests on our plan. So you talk about $29 billion and, and you know, the $29 billion that, uh, that we have costed out in, in our plan. 
is divided between the GTHA and beyond, and you you know that. Uh, you know perfectly well that I didn't cut $4 billion out of the Transit City Plan. It's being spent right now. It's being spent right now. It's being it's a little building, bit late. A little it's bit building, late, Kathleen. <laughs> it's building the Eglinton Crosstown line. You know that. You know perfectly well that $16 billion is being invested in transit. So the reality is that we have a plan. We have we have brought forward a plan to continue to invest but in Ms. transit Lynn, because we know we know is your know wrong headed that decision. That is what is going to allow the infrastructure? What about that wrong headed decision to bring dirty diesel into the downtown? Okay. I mean, so, that is something <laughs> that uh, I can't believe in this day and age with a, an international city the likes of Toronto that the Liberals are putting a dirty diesel train well, right through downtown neighborhoods. So it makes no and, sense and whatsoever. I'm sure, and the four the four sure, billion Andrea, dollars you must have you must admit you were the you were the minister of transportation, Ms. Wynn, and you did say very clearly that you were going to take Andrea, four billion dollars out no, of Transit City. No. And Andrea, so, and so just, in your in your language, sorry, you, okay, you punted we, the funding into response? the future, I just, I just but you still a, didn't invest when you said you were going please. to. You've I just questions. need to respond because it's just not true. You are you're making things up, Andrea, because the oh. fact is the four billion dollars, that was a cash flow issue. That money is being spent right now. It is building the Eglinton Crosstown line and you know it. In terms of the Union Pearson to uh, the, the Union State to Pearson uh, train, you know that that train was part of the bid for the Pan Am Games. It will have the highest quality, the cleanest diesel in the wow. world, tier four diesel, and it's convertible to electric. That train will so be converted to double. electric because it was in the bid book and it couldn't, you couldn't build it that fast. So that that's yeah. why it's uh, so that's why it's being built the, the way it is. So you're the well-being of the people in those neighborhoods because you couldn't build no, it fast enough. No, actually, we're putting. It's that's the what cleanest, leadership is not. It's Kathleen the Wynn. cleanest that's diesel. What leadership is not. <laughs> Well, I have to say. You know what? You know what leadership is? It's having a plan to make sure that we can invest in the transit and the roads and the bridges that are needed Ms. across Wynne, this province. That's the plan that we have. it's your government that took money out of the winter maintenance program. We had carnage on northern highways because your government took money out of the winter maintenance program for those roads that are literally the lifeline of northerners. Those That's standards. That's the record of your government, I Ms. Have Wynne, to jump in when here. it comes to transportation Mr. investments. Mr. Hudak's chance to exactly join the debate. The same as they've always well, well, thank you, uh, Steve. Um, let me say to Colleen and, and, and Kohlberg and those at home, I'm somebody who believes fair is fair. And, you know, I'm tired of Dalton McGinty, now Kathleen Wynne, pitting one province, part of the province, against the other. We shouldn't play special favorites. I want to make sure that small, Ontario, small town Ontario is booming and our big cities like Toronto, Ottawa and Hamilton are booming too. To make sure our whole province together moving forward. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You know, Debbie and Miller and Maitland and I, Maitland of course now, just two months old. We live in Welland Port. And everybody in West Lincoln, where we live, they pay the same gas tax as everybody else. But under the Dalton McGinty and Kathleen Wynne plan, they don't get any money back for roads or bridges. Our plan will ensure that every municipality gets their fair share of gas tax revenue for transportation. Now let local councils decide if they want to put into roads or bridges, the subways or buses. And secondly, you know, I want to make sure that we can get Toronto moving again. And I've said this now twice tonight, but you are right. Andrea is right about this. You were transportation minister. You cut the budget and you didn't build a single new subway stop over 11 years. My plan to make sure we build subways in the city of Toronto, starting with an east-west crosstown and then north to Richmond Hill and east to Scarborough. And I want to expand our GO train service, which is a strength in the system, with more all-day two-way service. And expand the rush so, hours till 9 a.m. in the morning so, and 8 so, p.m. at night so families can actually get really home and spend I, time That's together. a really good idea. And it's in our plan to electrify the whole GO system. But you know what? What you haven't talked about is whether you're going to support the LRT in Ottawa, because apparently you're not going to support the LRT well, in I'm Ottawa. You that. haven't talked about whether you're going to support the LRT in Kitchener-Waterloo. We have a plan that supports those municipalities, that allows those municipalities to build the transit that they need. And Colleen, to your question, it does not ask you in Coburg to pay for those transit, uh, those transit solutions in the greater Toronto-Hamilton area. It divides the money around the province and allows for the roads and the bridges that are needed in small communities and also allows for the transit in our larger urban centres. And I'm, I'm glad we're talking about transit. I'm glad we're talking about infrastructure. But you need to know, Colleen, that we have brought forward a plan that is costed we have been making investments in infrastructure. Neither of neither of the other parties have well, supported those investments, I mean, let's, let's and they don't this. have a plan to continue there, the there's building. There's no doubt that that if Kathleen Wynne gets reelected, 
she's going to increase your taxes. I mean, she says she's going to balance the budget, but a few minutes ago she didn't lay out a single idea to reduce spending. She said earlier on that every government job is precious. She's not going to have any reductions in government anywhere, including Drive Clean or the Ontario Power Authority. She's actually going to add on more. So the only choice she has is to raise taxes. We've seen this movie before. Dalton McGuinty said he wouldn't raise taxes. He got elected. He increased taxes. And Kathleen, I've known you for a long time. I respect the work that you did. You took on some tough cabinet jobs, but you've changed. And you're using the same tricks you learned from Dalton McGuinty. Because we all know if you don't have an idea on how to balance the budget, you're going to increase taxes on families like Colleen's across well, the province. Tim, Why don't you just admit the truth so that there's no way to balance the budget <laughs> in your plan unless you actually increase taxes like Dalton McGuinty did? Well, I've been very, very clear. Uh, and Colleen, I, I, you know, you can look at our plan. I've been very, very clear about the investments that I believe we absolutely need to make. And those are investments in people and their talent and skills. They're investments in infrastructure like the infrastructure you are talking about. And they are investments in a business climate and supports for business that will allow them to thrive. I've seen, I've seen Tim Hudak's movie before too. Tim Hudak was part of a government that slashed public services and did not care for the interests of the people of the province in terms of education, in terms of health care, and said, said that they were going to, but then did See, not. That's again. what Mike there, Harris said. There, there so it is there. You She's talk going to about seeing a movie before. I've seen plan. that movie before. Steve, you see somebody here who's going to distort our plan because she doesn't want to talk about <laughs> her record. And her record is one with Dalton McGuinty of saying no new taxes and then increasing taxes at the last election campaign. I, and that money that could have gone in from Tim, the gas plant could have gone into our highway system. Let me ask you I this. I think I've laid out our plan. There's another piece that we need to keep in mind here. Why did not a single person here. ever get fired? Why did nobody I lose their job? Why did nobody ever get called up on the carpet for the gas plant scandal? Can you name one person who lost their job? The liberal government Half a minute left here and we haven't heard from Ms. Horvath When it comes to keeping the promises that they make. I mean, we, Ms. Wynn, you talk about Kitchener-Waterloo. I can remember something about a Highway 7 expansion in the 2007 election campaign and then again in the Andrew. 2011 election campaign. And here we are, and that, still pro that project still has not been undertaken. I can remember well, the Thunder just, Bay but, gas but plant Andrea, conversion. But, Andrea, that's just not true. Uh, it, the, Highway the 7, the Highway 7. Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, and again, I need the same story. Save some time to reply. It's Go ahead. It's just not true, Andrea. The... The property is being bought up along the Highway 7 corridor. It is being expanded. It takes time to build a road. It takes time to do the engineering and acquire the properties. That it project is underway. Okay. To keep their promises. <laughs> Leaders, I'm jumping in here because we are down to our final question. This is the sixth video question. It's about education. Uh, Tim Hudak, you'll have the first response. Andrea Horvath after that. Let's roll the tape. Hi, my name is Louise Howlings and I'm a teacher from Newmarket. My question for the candidates is, what specifically will you do for Ontario's elementary and high school students and to encourage hardworking teachers to remain in their positions and not be afraid for their job security? Mr. Hudak. Well, thank you, Louise. You know, um, I'm proud of my little girl, Miller. Miller's had some challenges. She's doing a lot better in school. You know, when I was growing up, um, my dad used to always give me math problems. Maybe that explains why I've got this background in economics. <laughs> Might explain my personality a little bit. Maybe that's just keep me quiet on our long trips to Sarney to visit the family. But he, he inspired in me a love for mathematics. I think it served me well in my life. And I do the same with my daughter, working through problems with her. And I'm really proud, Steve, that she got an A in mathematics in, in her class. But here's what I worry about. Despite the fact that we're spending $8.5 billion more in education and we have 225,000 fewer students, we're actually seeing our test scores decline in mathematics. When Kathleen Wynne was education minister, she brought something called discovery math into our schools. Discovery math meant that you didn't have to memorize multiplication tables. And the problem is when students graduated, employers soon discovered that people couldn't do basic math. So they didn't get the job. Meanwhile, right next door to us in Quebec, they rejected that fad. They made sure the students could do the multiplication tables. And any guesses on what province actually leads Canada in mathematics? I'll get rid of the discovery math. I'll make sure students have mathematics skills. I'll bring in specialty math teachers into our classroom. We'll bring in a new test in science at grade eight as well, because so many students are gonna depend on strong mathematics and science skills to get the jobs of tomorrow. And I'm also going to do, you asked about the high schools. We've got to do a lot more when it comes to skilled traits. 
in our schools. I want to encourage colleges to track back into our high schools to open the eyes of young men and young women to good jobs in the trades. Those are my priorities for education, and I want to make sure my daughters excel like you want to see for your kids too. Thank you, Mr. Hudak. Ms. Horvath. Uh, Louise, I want to uh, thank you for the question as well. It's interesting. I was in Sarnia not too long ago uh, talking to a woman uh, who was, was afraid she was going to lose her job uh, because the child care centre is closing in that community. And it's closing because the Liberals have destabilised our child care system in Ontario. And, of course, uh, we know that child care is an important part of early learning and it helps children uh, succeed in, in grade school and then on to high school. New Democrats have made a commitment of $100 million dollars to stabilize our child care system uh, because uh, the Liberals have left us with uh, literally dozens of potential closures in child care. But when it comes to education, I can tell you what I won't do. I won't disrespect uh, the hard-working educational workers in this province. I won't uh, start uh, creating chaos in our schools uh, and pretend that somehow I can, uh, I can dictate uh, what should be a process of discussion when it comes to, uh, to you guys, you're dealing with, uh, with your collective agreements. Uh, that's what Ms. Wynne and her government did. That's what Mr. Hudak says he wants to do some more of. All it did was create chaos for children and families. Uh, Ms. Wynne's government started that uh, because they wanted to gain a seat. Uh, that wasn't looking after the interests of our kids or our families or, frankly, educational workers. Mr. Hudak wants to fire 100,000 people. How many of those people are going to be the educational support workers that help, for example, your, your nephew uh, who needs speech therapy every day? That's what Mr. Hudak is talking about. We respect educational workers. We're determined to Thank bring you, into Horvath. Ontario supports uh, for educational Thank you, uh, for, one on, for education. Well, we, one on but one we debate. also... The answer to your question, Ms. Horvath, uh, is not a single one. Every dollar for special needs kids is going to go into special needs education. I mean, this, this is personal. I'm going to make sure it happens. L let me tell you something. I, um, I remember going to graduation at Grimsby High School in my riding. There was a young man with autism. And he got through high school. And it would have sent chills down your spine to see how his fellow students at, at Grimsby Secondary School gave him a standing ovation when he walked across the, school, uh, the, the floor and got his diploma. Now, can you imagine that? The strength, the determination, the perseverance when you have special needs and, and you fight through that and drive and succeed? In fact, a big part of my Million Jobs plan is to make sure those with disabilities are going to get more jobs, to contribute those incredible skills uh, into the workplace. So, so you ask me, is somebody who's a special needs teacher or an EA going to lose a job? Quite the opposite. I want to see more of it. And I want to see an education system in this great province of Ontario that is unlike any other where special needs kids are going to excel and then get good jobs. Well, Mr. Hudak, you know, I, I have to say that I think everybody believes that you're going to cut 100,000 jobs in this province, but nobody believes it's not going to somehow impact our education system. What, what New Democrats are going to do, though, is we're going to make sure that kids are ready to learn when they go to school. So we have a plan to expand breakfast nutrition programs for our youngest uh, children. Uh, there's too many kids that are going to school with, with bellies that are empty, and we know uh, that they can't uh, be prepared to learn if they're coming to school on an empty belly. Uh, we're also going to make sure that we're keeping schools open by offering school boards a chance to make a different decision than the, the rock in a hard place that the Liberals have put those school boards in. So our open school board, our open schools fund rather, uh, will help us to keep uh, schools open, giving schools opportunities not only to uh, to utilize that fund uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, change certain spaces that perhaps are not working for them, but also to keep schools open in the evenings and on weekends so that young people, uh, for example, don't have to be kicking around the streets. Uh, they can be hanging out in the gym, shooting hoops. Uh, seniors in communities can be using the school for their euchre clubs or their bridge clubs. Me, um, so this fund helps schools to keep their lights could, on, Steve, to keep studio staff to, to point out a, a significant difference, though, and I, I respect what um, Ms. Horvath has talked about. I know she's sincere. One of my goals, though, is to make sure that we have the best possible teacher in front of our kids. You want to see that for your son, I want to see that for my two daughters. But one of the changes that Ms. Wynne brought in as education minister was that the person in front of the class wouldn't necessarily be the best teacher. It would be ever, who was ever on the union seniority list, who was around the longest. I, I reject that. 
I want to see the teacher in front of the class who is going to inspire but them. Mr. I remember Hudak, the story. Your but, plan, you... but your plan, Mr. Hudak, will lead us exactly where we've been too but many Andrew, times you know, that's in this not province. True. So if you I two can, were talking can... about the same old movie before. i got to tell you, the movie that throws uh, our education system into chaos, that but you, you, you have this. to be honest you with people, choice, Mr. You Hudak. Had a this vote. plan does not work. We're still in the courts right now with the wrong kind of direction that the Liberals went in. And you think somehow we're going to do that again? Gentlemen, we can't hear you. We're both are speaking at once. same way as the Liberals. So, Andrea, if you vote 97 percent the same way as really. liberals 97 percent of the time okay time that's for not me to leadership jump in here that's a rubber stamp kathleen wynn gets in thank you now. i'm only standing here because uh, of my commitment to publicly funded education louise um, i got involved in provincial politics to protect the publicly funded education system against uh the changes and the cuts that uh, that Mike Harris was uh, was implementing when my kids were in school, and you know, since we have been in office, we have seen uh, we have seen test scores go up. The graduation rate when we came into office was 68 percent; it's now 83 percent. But there are some groups that are that are still not achieving, and so part of our plan is to make sure that we continue to focus on those kids. One of the programs that Tim Hudak talked about is called dual credits. It's already in place where kids who are in high school can take a, a credit at uh, at college we instituted that and it's working it's meaning kids who might fall through the cracks otherwise think about going on to post-secondary making sure the kids have the capacity to compete in a 21st century economy 150 million dollars we're putting in place to help schools buy technology we need to make sure that kids have the right tools so that they can compete and then they, they can go on to other either post-secondary or on to a, a skilled trade but quite Ms. frankly they need those skills the Respect that you showed to the educational workers of this province and the chaos that you threw everyone into with that wrong-headed decision. Well, so and what, 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 what everybody can understand, I think, is that we are a party that makes sense. Our plan makes sense because it focuses on your priorities, and one of those priorities is respect. We respect our educational yeah. workers, we respect our families, uh, we respect Ontario. Which is exactly... And that's why our, the plan that uh, that we've brought forward is one that respects your tax dollars well, and, and the invests in those the priorities. The collective bargaining process is very important to me and to our party. And you will know, Andrea, what about that Bill you, will know, well, you will know that we brought in legislation to make sure that we have, we have a, a strong collective bargaining process in the education sector the next time around because it went wrong. You're absolutely right. And we have put in Ms. place Lynn, a better program. you did the program. same thing we over again when you teamed up with Mr. Hudak to drive a bill through the House that did the exact same thing, that interfered with the exact same processes. So that's the problem. Well, you can say one thing one are, day, but people different can't situation, trust Andrea. you that you're actually going to live up to your word. We've seen broken promise after broken promise. Andrea. We've seen wasted money after wasted money. We've seen billions spent on political well-being of Liberals, but yeah. not on the but priority it's a, it's a of Ontarians. It's a very good speech by Andrea, and I, I'd agree with the vast majority of it. Uh, I do support a wage freeze. And I'm the only one standing up here that says that we'll freeze wages for all of us in government, starting with the politicians. It'll save us two billion a year, and I think it's a, a you fair didn't and reasonable our thing. That did but that. Well, you know, we did actually, <laughs> Kathleen. We voted for it. But no, 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 Andrew, let me ask to you this: to freeze MPP me, wages? No, you didn't. You yeah, stalled it. Let me ask it. you this, Andrea. You, you say that you're different, but 97 percent of the time, 97 percent of the time, you voted the same as the Liberals. That's not leadership. That, that's Mr. a rubber Hudak, stamp. And Mr. when Hudak, hydro bills have know, gone up by six hundred fifty dollars, let me just Mr. say, Hudak, aren't half the costs actually on your back because Hudak, you prop them up ninety-seven the percent of the years, time? When I look at the last three years, Mr. Hudak, I don't see a single thing that you've been able to accomplish. You've spent the last three years Andrew. really not accomplishing anything, and now you're telling the people of Ontario that somehow your plan that has bad math that's going to throw a hundred thousand people on onto the unemployment line is the best best choice for Ontario. I disagree. So the best true. choice for Louise, Ontario can I just, is plan can I just go back to Louise for one sec? Please? Louise, we are going to uh, make sure that full day kindergarten is implemented so that all four and five year olds across the province this coming September have access to full day kindergarten. We are going to respect the collective bargaining process and we have put in place legislation that defines the roles more clearly so that so that uh, teachers and support staff and school boards understand exactly what their what their roles are and we will continue to invest in education because we know that if we're going to compete globally and our kids do compete globally Globally. If we're going to compete globally, we need to have the best educated workforce, and that starts with our kindergarten and starts with our publicly funded education system. Last I just, minute? You know, I just, when, when I see the NDP um, who say they're different and say the Liberals are corrupt, 
when they vote for the Liberals 97% of the time, you know that's not leadership. That's basically a, a rubber stamp. So when your hydro bill has gone up by $650, when the gas plan scandal cost you a billion, if they voted with the Liberals 97% of the time, aren't half those costs on the NDP's back as much as the Liberals? Well, you know, it's interesting. I believe that uh, our first and foremost job once we're elected is to try to, to get results for people, to try to make their decision work for them. And, and they made a very clear decision a couple of years ago. And New Democrats worked hard. In fact, it was New Democrats who, whose work brought forward uh, the cover-up that happened with the gas plant scandal. And I know Ms. Wynne would like us to, to sweep that under the rug and, and not talk clear. about it. Uh, well, but the bottom just... line is, uh, that's what New Democrats do. We work hard and we try to get results for people. Uh, and that's what I'm looking forward to doing. And leaders, uh, that is well. our time. <laughs> that is our time for debate. We have time left for closing statements. You've drawn lots. Tim Hudak, you go first. Well, thank you, Steve. And I know we have two and a half minutes, but I'm not going to take up the entire time because I think that the choice tonight is crystal clear. And so is my message. Hope is on the way. I appreciate you tuning in tonight. I appreciate the great debate with my colleagues, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Horvath. But there's only one leader standing on the stage tonight who's been direct with you and who's been honest and who's laid out a plan to bring jobs back to our province and reduce spending in the province of Ontario. And I made a commitment tonight as well that if I don't actually carry out my plan, I'll step aside. I am so confident my million jobs plan is going to get Ontario back to work. That's my commitment to you. Soon you hear Ms. Wynn speak. I bet she spends a good part of her time attacking my plan because she doesn't want to talk about a record. I understand that. It's one of high taxes, lost jobs, energy increases, and scandal. But if you give me the option, if you give me the opportunity to be your next premier, I will fight hard for you each and every day. I will think every day about how I'm going to make sure your son or daughter has a good chance at a job and to respect your tax dollars. Hope is coming. Opportunity is around the corner. Jobs are on the way. And that's my commitment to you. Thank you. Andrew Horvath. I want to start by saying that uh, there's no doubt that you have a very important decision ahead of you. Uh, you don't have to choose, however, between a corrupt Liberal Party that wastes your money uh, and a Tim Hudak plan to fire 100,000 people. You can choose a party that respects you with a plan that makes sense. Your tax dollars should be invested in your priorities, not wasted on spiraling CEO salaries, on, on CEO on ads that are partisan, not to waste it on corruption and scandal like, like the uh, Orange Air Ambulance, like, uh, like the, um, uh, the, uh, the scandal with the gas plants. Uh, we don't have to vote for a party that brings you the e-health scandal. You're hardworking, honest people in this province, and you deserve a hardworking, honest government, one that respects your tax dollars and that invests those tax dollars in your priorities. And that's what New Democrats are offering, making your life more affordable, getting the HST off your hydro, getting those rates down when it comes to your, uh, uh, your uh, insurance, uh, your auto insurance, making sure our health care system works for you. We're going to get wait times and emergency uh, down by 50%. How? Investing in nurse practitioners in the ER, getting rid of the wait lists in home care and long-term care, bringing new family health clinics, 24-hour ha family health clinics to this province. We're going to invest your tax dollars in things like the environment, protecting our environment, making sure that our poverty rates are going down, uh, making sure that our education system is working for children uh, and their families. We have listened. I have listened carefully to what you've told me over the last number of years. I've not only listened, but I've heard you, and I respect you. And if you give me the opportunity to become your premier on June 12th, I will deliver for you. Kathleen Wynne. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I don't know all of you, obviously, but I've met a lot of you. And uh, you are good, hardworking people who care about your families. You care about your communities. And you want the very best for them. And you're going to be facing a very stark choice next Thursday. You're going to be facing a, a choice between a party, uh, our party, that is bringing you a plan, that is uh, laying out a plan, that will bring us forward, that will move us forward, that will make the critical investments in 
people and in their talent and skills, in the infrastructure that we know is needed in order for us to be able to compete, and in a business climate uh, that is going to allow businesses to thrive, is going to allow them to expand and allow them to compete in the 21st century. And all of that underpinned by uh, a retirement security plan that actually uh, allows people to not worry about, uh, not worry so much about uh, financial insecurity when they do retire. I think that's that's something that uh, everyone should be able to expect. So it's a choice between that and, quite frankly, uh, a party that's bringing forward a plan that would push us back to recession. I don't think that that is where we should go. We are in uncertain times still. The recovery is taking hold. We can see it. We can see it in our communities. Businesses are starting to expand. There are jobs coming. But to put a shock into the system that would push us back to recession would be, it would just be wrong for the province. So you have, you have a, a hard decision to make because the fact is we all believe in public service. We wouldn't be in politics if we didn't. I'm bringing you my integrity, the work that I have done over the last year and a bit, about 16 months, and I've made a lot of changes. There are more changes that we need to make, but they have to do with making sure we make the right investments so that we can move forward and we can support all of the people in our communities, whether it's health care that they need or whether it is uh, it's early, childhood, early childhood education or full day kindergarten. We need all of those supports in place. So I thank you again for uh, joining tonight. Merci, miigwech, and all the best. Well, I have watched all of you give a lot of speeches in the legislature and always, 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 you take every second of the time. <laughs> and tonight, you didn't. <laughs> and we find ourselves actually a minute light. So is there anything else you guys want to talk about tonight? No, I can't really do that. But let's thank uh, Kathleen Wynne, the leader of the Ontario Liberals, Tim Hudak, the leader of the Ontario Progressive Conservatives, thank you. and Andrea Horvath, the leader of the Ontario NDP, for coming to the Broadcast Centre in downtown Toronto tonight and engaging in this now time-honoured tradition of having a leader's debate before the election, which is only nine days away. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank that you. is our time tonight. We want to thank the leaders for being here. We want to thank you for watching. And, of course, we do want to remind everybody that Election Day is Thursday, June the 12th. We encourage you, even if you decline your ballot, we encourage you to vote. I'm Steve Pakin. Good night, everybody, from Toronto. during the Stanley Cup playoffs.